A very good afternoon. Welcome to Brothers in Corporation. This is our maiden program and I'm privileged that you're watching us and you're our audience. We will be running every week Saturdays at this time and we will be bringing to you works that other people are doing to change lives of others. Brothers in Corporation is not about biological brothers. It's about brothers emotionally and in terms of work, people who want to make a difference in people's lives. It's brought to us through the support of the Italian Corporation. My name is Saren Sigae. I'll be hosting this program. And today with us in the studio, we have Alex, we have um, Francesca, Francesca Oliva from Absi. From Absi. Am and I pronouncing it properly? Exactly, Absi. She's also a representative and a liaison officer for Foundation for, for Development Africa. for Africa. We also have uh, with us Okot PBTEC. No, no Charles no, no. BTEC. <laughs> Are you related to Okot PBTEC? No, I'm not. Okay. Yeah. He's also one of the people who are working wi with others. So he's a member of the Brothers in Corporation in a sense that with an Italian organization supported by the Foundation for Africa, they are changing lives in northern Uganda. He will be talking to us in detail about what they do. We also have Madame Zura Asanda who works for AMREF. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I'm pleased to be here. They'll be telling us more about what they do. Charles will also be telling us more about what they do. But before that, we are going to get an excerpt from the studio about what it is, what Foundation for Africa is and what they do before we give you more details from the studios. Thank you. Foundation for Africa, Foundations for Africa, is first of all an alliance of uh, private Italian philanthropic institutions who are very active in Italy, supporting the not-for-profit sector uh, in different areas of work like uh, social welfare, research, art and culture, and uh, environment. Uh, development cooperation is a new uh, field of operation for uh, the foundations, for the philanthropic institution. And uh, this alliance is also a first initiative, joint initiative, uh, supporting uh, the creation of networking in uh, Italy and uh, in, in the country of operation. Uh, we are a sort of uh, donor partnership with a special mandate. And the mandate is to promote uh, the excellences of uh, cooperation in the countries uh, selected, and specifically in Africa, and to build up on the very long experience and competency developed by uh, Italian NGOs and their local partners and local authorities in order to reach the maximum impact uh, as far as development, development initiatives. That was Roberta Romano. She represents Foundation for Africa. And um, she's given us a brief about what it is they do. I'm just curious and I would like you to tell me why Uganda? Yeah. Uh, just to, pre uh, to correct you, it was uh, Cristina Toscano that is uh, the responsible of uh, Foundations for Africa from Italy. She represents the donor, the four foundations. Um, why Uganda? Uh, well, first of all, because there is a very long uh, history of cooperation between Italy and Uganda. There were already a number of organizations uh, present uh, in northern Uganda, Italian organizations. Uh, uh, let's say that the youngest were at least uh, 15 years old and the oldest more th than 30 years old. And they are organizations that uh, um, really can show excellences in many different fields, uh, from education to health, uh, like we will explain a little bit later. But then also because uh, Uganda um, has been through, Northern Uganda has been through a very long war, civil war, and in 2004, um, the Under Secretary of the United Nations defined uh, uh, Uganda as the worst uh, humanitarian crisis uh, forgotten by the world. And, uh, of course, this is an important reason why we decided to focus uh, on northern Uganda. Okay, interesting. I, I'm, I also understand that uh, this is supported by banks or organizations that mm -hmm. were formerly banks. And I'm curious to know, yeah. are there any economic interests for those Italian banks to support the cause in poor northern Uganda where there is a war? What are the expectations? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, actually, it's important in indeed, and thank you for this question, to, uh, to explain that uh, uh, these uh, philanthropic institutions uh, were born uh, um, as uh, uh, philanthropic banks uh, uh, a lot of time ago. The uh, eldest one is actually uh, from the 16th century, and the other ones were from the 19th century. So these, uh, uh, let's say, saving uh, uh, banks were born uh, to, uh, to help already the poorest people to ac access credit, credit and they were also doing and implementing other philanthropic uh, um, uh, uh, interventions. But in uh, a law in the 90s decided to divide uh, the financial roles from the philanthropic roles and so different subjects were born from, this, uh, from that uh, law and, and that is when the, the philanthropic institutions called foundations were born. So basically uh, nowadays they are completely independent uh, and they are self-funding because they are keeping their, their um, some stake into the banks that were, b were born out of them and uh, they self-fund with those, uh, with those capitals. And uh, they are uh, becoming more and more important uh, nowadays in the, um, in the philanthropic world, uh, especially because they are uh, so independent, they can act fast, they are flexible, um, and, uh, uh, and they are uh, getting more and more involved in the issues that affect uh, uh, the entire world. So they were originally more focused on uh, the territory they were born in, so Italy and the regions they were born in, um, and slowly, mm, slowly by slowly they started uh, getting more interested in the global agenda just because it is becoming so rich of, <laughs> of many issues. Thank you for that uh, explanation. Uh, I, I'm curious and I can't wait because on this show we'll be inviting the Italian ambassador to Uganda. I'm curious because there is no such thing as free lunch but what is interesting is that these banks put money to the cause of the poor. Of course, somebody educated me and told me that banks do not pay taxes. Because they do not pay taxes, their governments also encourage them to give back to society, and they choose. What is interesting is they choose Uganda. What is more interesting is that the Italian corporation has been supporting areas in the north which historically are quite marginalized. We'll be hearing more from this program when you join us, how they work in Karamoja, how they work in northern Uganda, and set up projects. And they sort of like try to bridge in the gap. Usually, you know that there's interest. What I want to know is where are the economic interests. But back to you, I'm interested to know where the the areas that you come into when you're intervening, when you decide to come to Uganda because we are declared as an, a country that has been neglected and needs support, particularly the North, how and what is the nature of that support? Yeah, basically all the support that has been uh, identified for Northern Uganda uh, is, uh, is based on the priority that are already identified within the PRDP, that is the Peace uh, um, Reconciliation Development Program for Northern Uganda. Um, and the interventions uh, uh, fall in the areas of health, education, um, uh, food security, economic uh, interventions, uh, um, water and peace and reconciliation. And we have six uh, organizations working uh, at this uh, big program uh, that are COPI, CESVI, AMREF, La Chor uh, uh, Hospital with the foundations, uh, Corti Foundation, um, and Good Samaritan uh, and COPI. I hope I I mentioned all of them. All of them sound Italian? <laughs> yes, they are all Italian. Do indeed. you insist on supporting Italian-based organizations? They are more conversant with the, the problems in the north than the people from the north themselves? Well, um, let's say that uh, the, the philanthropic foundations that funded this program, usually they used to fund uh, uh, only I Italian institutions uh, that were work that are working in Italy, implementing activities in Italy. But as I mentioned, they decided to open to uh, issues that uh, go uh, outside, even outside Uganda, go no one outside U outside Italy. Sorry, mm. um, and so uh, they they decided to to start uh, uh, with uh, the Italian organizations that have been for so long in northern Uganda, uh, identifying uh, the existence of very big excellences already on the field. And let's remember also that these organizations have been working uh, with the community and with the local government since they have started in northern Uganda. So, um, uh, and uh, during the, the displacement, uh, the government itself and the government structure were very much uh, uh, under pressure because of the, of the war situation and it was uh, uh, of help also for the local government to have some outside support. 
So the issue is not really uh, preferring uh, Italian organization to uh, Ugandan ones, but trying to, to build something together, put together the expert, putting together the expertise of organizations that have been working in this field for, for a very long time. Interesting. And um, when you tell me that uh, the problems of, of northern Uganda, there were communities that were already based there and they were working, I'd like to know those organizations, what they are doing now, considering that the war is over and it's reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Is there still a need for, for helping us out of a crisis? Yeah. What's the crisis? Yeah, this is uh, another very good question. Um, yeah, mm, let's say that the, the, the insurgency uh, uh, stopped uh, officially in 2006 with the start of the peace talks, but th that never ended with, uh, uh, with the real uh, signature of a peace agreement. And, and uh, there was a big process starting from 2006 of uh, um, reconstruction. And first of all, helping people going back to their homes. And this is a process that takes a lot of time. People have been living in uh, IDP camps, uh, almost 1.8 million people for uh, uh, almost uh, 10 years and the process of uh, bringing them back home uh, is quite long. So uh, in the last report of Ocha we, uh, we know that now about 94-97% uh, 90, of the population is back home but this is really because of the effort of uh, the, lo the government of Uganda and the international donors, international organizations and the local organizations that have been working together along this time. So the reconstruction is still ongoing, I think. So there, there's been uh, very much room for us to work here. And I think there is still a little bit of time for us to still stay. Of course, I'll be interested to hear more about um, what you do, how you're dealing with the reconstruction process. But also, I want to remind our viewers that we have uh, Charles Bitek, who comes from Chevsi. And um, I would be interested in learning more from Charles about the food security. We have uh, Zuri Asanda from Amrev. And all, as you know, if you don't, that AMREP deals in the area of health. Children, that is the impression I got. I don't know if they also cross over to others, but we'll be hearing more from Zura. Charles, yes. food security in the north, where we have rich and fertile soils. Why? Hello, as you said, my name is Charles Bitek. I come from CSV. Mm -hmm in Kalongo, in Pade, now Agago district. <coughs> uh, CESV, with support from Foundation for Africa, is uh, working on the area of food security and livelihood. Um, as Francisca mentioned, uh, we work in community that have been in the IBDP camp for some time, and now they are going back, and some have gone back home. Uh, while in the IDP camp, uh, they were supported with food aids. Now, we want them to produce their own food, to be food sufficient. Okay, yes. so tell me how you do that. Yeah. So, um, in the area of food security and livelihood, we do basically two things. Mm -hmm. One, mm. agricultural extension, using the farmer field school approach. Mm -hmm and provision of agricultural inputs, like seeds and farm tools. There is this problem that with the establishment or with the flourishing of non-government organizations, people have learned to become more dependent in a country where we have lots of seeds and people are farming. Do they need Seeds, are you doing it for now? And they will go to, through to a process where they get the seeds themselves. Do you give better seeds than the seeds they don't ha have? Oh, thank you very much for that question. Now, um, in the food security area, uh, as I said, there's provision of inputs, farm inputs, which include the seeds and farm tools, and the training, the extension training. So um, we uh, provide them with improved seeds, improved seeds uh, that are high healing, resistant to pests and diseases, mature faster, and uh, yield per acre is higher. So, um, but these seeds, um, as you ask a question related to sustainability, uh, the farmers will be able to multiply some of these seeds and it's eventually enough for everybody in the long run. 
So who do you give when? Who d like what is the basis on which you decide that these are the people who are going to benefit from these extensions or from these seeds? And how long does the process of, say, giving them the seeds run, considering that they should be able to harvest and, co and have their own seeds? Right. Um, our beneficiaries, of course, uh, a program cannot take care of everyone. So um, we, are, we have been working with 900 households. Impressive. And, and that 900 household um, is what the project could support mm -hmm. uh, at this time. So um, the, the 900 are our direct beneficiaries. And um, so I if you take the 900 household uh, plus their household m members, that's a, a more or less a large number of beneficiaries we already. Are we are talking about which area? We are operating in uh, Agago. Agago district. Mm. It's a, a new district in four sub counties in Agago. Mm. Uh, with 900 households who are that our direct beneficiaries uh, supporting them with the farm inputs and the trainings. Mm -hmm. And the other um, area of our work is more or less uh, income generations. We give the beneficiaries an opportunity to select enterprises of their services. I need you to educate me. Which beneficiaries? The beneficiaries who benefit from the agriculture training programs and the seeds? Yes. Then you want them to identify other economic um, activities? As a, as, as a matter of background, these people are in groups of 25 or 30. So um, we have about 30 groups. So that is 900 households. So the same beneficiaries, we are supporting them to become food secure. Are the same beneficiaries, uh, we are engaging them to income to generate. You've really like gotten me either more curious or I think I need further education about people who you're supporting for agriculture and then you give them other incoming activities. I think when we come back after the break, I would be interested to know if agriculture is not enough for them or you're just providing them support for food not cash crops or not foods that they grow outside and then you give them income generating activities but when we come back after the break we'll hear more from from zura sander but also from bitek and of course we'll go back to francesca thank you please don't go away stay with us you want to know how you can be a part of the brothers in cooperation after the break Nora, before you go Welcome back. Um, Charles, before we went for the break, you left me not confused, but I was in thirst for further education in terms of why you want to, to give people. I am not against giving people income generating activities. I just need a clarification in a sense that uh, do you give them only food for them to use at home? That's why you find a need for economic activities. Is it like agriculture is not sustainable income generating activity? Thank you very much. Um, a, a reminder, my name is Bitek Charles. <laughs> I come from CSV in Calon, and we are working in the area of food security and livelihoods. Back to the questions. Um, agriculture is enough. But um, the beneficiaries also need to engage themselves in an income generating activities. For clarity, the enterprises they are engaging in as for income generation is more or less agricultural enterprises. 
you will find a group doing piggery, for instance. So piggery is an agricultural what? Enterprises. So um, agriculture as a whole is growing crops and the animals. So the income generation can either be for crops or for livestock, animals. So uh, it's both ways. Uh, other groups are engaged in crops and other groups are engaged in animals. Yeah. So the ones you give crops, you don't give them animals? Okay. Um, maybe I need to cl clarify the, pro the process of enterprise selection, mm -hmm. which, which eventually ends up with the income generation. We uh, ask our beneficiaries what they think they would do to generate money. Then they come out with a wasteful list of so many things. Then um, we, as the, the, as the technical organization guiding them, we know there could be some other better thing that they are not, for instance, exposed to. So from their wasteful list, we do uh, a market study to uh, establish the e economic viability and sustainability of the enterprise they are wishing to engage in. So after doing the market study, we go back to our uh, benef beneficiaries and say, look, you are wishing to engage in this as an income generation activities. This is what it takes. This is the market. This is what is required of you. This is the uh, money you are going to get. And then we give them opportunity to choose after uh, just a guideline to choose what they want to engage in. Of course, w with resources, we cannot support more than one or two of the income generation activities at a time. So a group can hope for one, and that is what, what they will go for. Mm. Yes. So if, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, that gives me like, a better sense of what happens. And um, I'm really interested in the question of sustainability when I come back to you. But before that, I, I would like you to at least explain to me briefly how you identify beneficiaries as groups. How do you avoid a question of, you know, African families, you can have in one family 25 members and your groups are 25 members. How do you identify the people who most actually need this intervention and support? Just that, who qualifies to be part of that project, to benefit from that project? Okay. Um, uh, maybe I need to mention this. We work in partnership with the local government, more or less the South County and local government authorities. So uh, the, the, the process of identifying uh, these groups is, is a long one rather, but it's through the guidance of the local government authority at the sub-county level, but also um, through our own ground working. When we uh, go for community meeting, we pass out uh, the measures and people who are willing, who have understood the measures can uh, come out and join the group we would like to, to work with, with the support and guidance of the local government authority at the sub-county levels. Okay, the other interesting thing about this project generally is that organizations are working together and I know that later when we come back we'll hear from Charles because he, he partners, there are other organizations that are supported by the Foundation for Africa that do exactly what you do and I was thinking we don't need a replica if you're doing it but I'll, you'll give us further details. I can't wait to hear from Zura about AMREF because uh, AMREF has been dealing with health and I thought that AMREF is big enough. Why they have to go to Foundation for Africa, I don't understand, but uh, I'd like you to educate me and what you do with them. Thank you very much, Sarah. Why the African Medical Research Foundation, which definitely is for, for the African, for better health for all Africans. 
This is why we have to partner with other colleagues who are definitely thinking that we need to have a better health, mainly like our people in Acholi sub-region who have gone through the war for 20 years. They found it necessary to come in and support the health program in the northern Uganda to make sure that we come together and we bring a better health. Okay. Um, I would like to know the nature of the support that you do and how you work it out. But I'm curious because I've been getting an impression that um, uh, Foundation for Africa being Italian-based supports only organizations that are Italian-based. And my understanding is that AMREF is not Italian-based. How do you get into the picture? Yes. AMREF is not really an Italian. We are mixed up. We have our Italian colleagues. We have the European colleagues. We have the Asians and the Africans in general. So we work as a group. We work as a team to make sure that we bring better health for African people. OK. So what you do? With in, in the north, the partnership that you have, is it Foundation for Africa who came and told you that this is what we want you to do or they found you doing a project and maybe they loved the idea and they thought they needed to support what you are doing? What is the arrangement between you and Foundation for Africa? Actually, the arrangement with the need because the AMREF being the Medical Research Foundation we really found that there was need to improve on the health. So we made a proposal of knowing what our basic needs, how do we bring out our work so that we bring better health for the people of Acholi sub-region. Um, tell me, how do you take better health to the people of Acholi sub-region? The better health. Definitely, AMREF cannot do it alone. AMREF have to partner with the other people, like we have partner the, the authorities of the district, those having the health team members, the politicians, the community, and everybody involved. Then from there, we we'll definitely find out where is the need for this particular area. And this is why you find that uh, with the Foundation for Africa, AMREF does the work in seven districts of Acholi sub-region where we carry these services. And mainly these services, we look into the children of the under five, but we make emphasis on zero to 11 months. That means that those children should be protected with the eight immunizable diseases. We don't work alone. We have definitely to bring in the Koti Foundation that Slacho and make sure that it also have to treat the sick, has to admit, has definitely to work with the referral. Because for instance, when we are planning our activities in these hard to reach areas, where we need a lot of staff. We need so many health workers who are different in the different fields. We need the doctors, we need the nurses, we need the midwives, we need the lab, we need the social worker for counseling, we need nutrition, we need food, and we need drugs. So we have to come all together and make sure that we achieve that goal and we would need a lot of resources because you cannot move from for instance i would give you an example from guru up towards the end of uh, actually sub-region going to karamoja you only go just alone as zura but i have to get a number of colleagues we go and fight those problems at once yeah uh thank you very much well uh, I'm, I'm i'm just um, a bit curious when you, you say you insist on 0 to 11 months and uh, you, talk, you say you want them to get immunized and uh, I am aware that actually 
at, at least government indicates that now there is health facilities at least in every sub county and i know that immunization drugs are actually for free and you must come in and do that and why the emphasis on zero to eleven months yes as the actually amref we don't work alone we work under the policies of the minister of health with the who the world health organization the world health organization and the minister of health have got a policy that by the time the child is 11 months old would have gone through the eight immunizable diseases which definitely at one time brought quite a lot of problems like measles by the time a child is nine months old would have received protection of measles by the time a child is born would have been protected with the polio. And during that sequence, other diseases are also prevented. Okay. Uh, what I want to know is that why with all the health and sub-county facilities, AMREF thinks that they should be the relevant bodies to go. I don't know if you establish uh, immunization centers and what you do. What, what happens to all these uh, facilities that were instituted for that purpose, considering that immunization <coughs> is free of charge. Yes. With the AMREF, we definitely have three themes. We support the people in the district to do their own work. Hmm? We build the capacity of knowing either the capacity is on the training aspect, so we have to work with the other partners, like those like your hospital, to make sure that these people are very well trained, they have enough manpower to do that work. They have the facilities, like uh, the materials for training, like the cards, the books, and the knowledge. Because mainly with the AMREF, as you hear, most of the people who go to work with AMREF we are definitely very well qualified. We don't go for something. You have really to have your papers to have read and practiced for a quite long time to know that you will deal with those sort of problems. And on the other hand, it is also a research foundation. We have to do research. It's not only the people in the hospital can do research. Even yourself, Sarah, you have to do a research to find out why this problem existing so that you take it up because you want a better health for people of Africa. Okay, so you are talking about education, you are talking about not working to get alone, so you work with the people, I think the experts in these particular fields. So what is the nature of your support, financial? Of course, the financial is also there. Then in the terms of transport, in terms of bicycles, motorcycles. The transport for the patients? No. Mm -hmm. Of course, see, as I'm saying that transport, somebody to, because we expect to carry services into the villages where she has said. People have been in the setup of camps. They have now moved into their own localities, deep in the village. You, and they have left the services wherever they were in the camp. So we don't expect those people really to get a problem. So we have to follow them up to the village level. And we don't expect a mother or a father to walk a long distances. So usually the policy says that a mother or a father should not walk a distance of more than five kilometers. If Foundation for Africa was uh, a, an, a, a politician trying to campaign, they would be spot on because they, they seem to target the areas of health. They are targeting the areas of uh, food and the shortest cut to a man's heart is through his stomach. And then they are into education, so they have a very good manifesto. But I am interested in knowing more about education and other things when we come back after the break. Welcome back. Um, 
Before the break, I wanted to know more about education and if there's some political motivations in terms of understanding our manifesto. But first, I'll go to our phone call. We have Roberta Romano online. She's from Good Samaritan, one of the partners that are working under this for, uh, Foundation for Africa project in Northern Uganda. Roberta. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to have you. How are you doing? Good. Roberta Romano is good Samaritan, also a politician campaigning. Are you doing something that you know the people want to, mm. to vote for you? Because um, economic activities, establishing cooperatives is what I'm hearing you doing. I'm interested to know the background. Why? Good Samaritan is an Italian uh, organization made of volunteers. Mm. was born more than 10 years ago. Mm. Okay, um, so tell me about this uh, peace and reconciliation project. How are you doing with peace and reconciliation? Considering the crisis in northern Uganda where people have to go back in spaces where they were the same people who harmed the people they have to be to stay with. I'm sorry, I think I've, uh, I've, ha I've lost Roberta there, but uh, well, we'll keep trying to get back, her back online. I think I'll start from there, and I think, Francesca, I, I think I'll go directly to you because you have a bit of an understanding. Okay, you have an understanding of what they do in terms of reconciliation. So tell me, exactly how does Good Samaritan come into the picture? Yeah, basically, Good Samaritans been working uh, uh, in the area of uh, peace and reconciliation for the overall uh, population, not uh, targeting uh, for sure also people that uh, have been involved directly in the war, but uh, also all other people, because mm. you have to um, to consider that, of course, uh, um, every family in northern Uganda has been affected by the war. Everyone has lost somebody. Uh, somebody has uh, uh, personally been abducted, but somebody else has just been um, uh, the victim of uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of some uh, atrocities against uh, the family, but not maybe directly to the person. But in a situation like this, everybody has psychosocial problems. Everybody lives uh, uh, the relation with the other person with some difficulties. So. Uh, good Samaritan comes in with uh, a number of uh, uh, very good initiatives and trainings and sensitizations on uh, um, peace and reconciliation that they have been delivering to communities, to schools, uh, to the other beneficiaries of uh, the other partners uh, of Foundations for Africa. I can mention, for instance, the trainings that uh, uh, Good Samaritan uh, did with the, with the children within uh, uh, the education program that has been supported by ABSI. Uh, so they, they could train both the teachers and the students uh, on how to handle day-by-day -day conflicts and communication and mediation. Uh, then Good Samaritan also uh, was working with uh, a group of uh, former abductees, uh, trying to support them to be reintegrated in the community. Um, uh, uh, of course, Good Samaritan was following uh, what also was uh, uh, the guideline of the Acholi tradition. So the Acholi tradition in itself uh, has some, um, uh, some ways uh, they try to reconcile uh, the, the, the children, the people that have been abducted into the community. And Good Samaritan came uh, um, actually in a period when these uh, children are now adults. Uh, the, the, the main intervention uh, after the war and during the war was done also by other organizations
organizations that would uh, welcome these children uh, back home, uh, but when they were just back from the, from the bush. Uh, so Good Samaritan has been dealing with uh, adults that still have some problems in uh, maybe integrating in their community because they have psychosocial problems, uh, because in some mm, occasions uh, they are still seen as uh, uh, ex-rebels, or sometimes they just feel that they are. Sometimes it's not because they really are, but sometimes they feel there's something different with them. So they engage them also in uh, uh, economic activities and, uh, uh, and in community activities in order for to f make them feel as part of the community again. And I was feeling guilty for making you bear the cross of, uh, of Good Samaritan, but uh, it, it seems like things are on your fingertips. You might be curious as to why uh, Francesca is uh, conversant with what is happening, but as organizations, they do support each other. Also, she's the liaison officer. Earlier, we had from Tuscan, but she is the representative this is the liaison officer on ground. She works for Avis, which is also one of the partner organizations, but she also gives feedback. So she has a sense of what is happening with the other organizations. And knowing as you do, I do that you have a sense. I'd like you to tell me how the cooperative runs in the event that right. we do not su succeed in talking to Roberta. Yeah, the cooperative is another very interesting initiative that um, Good Samaritan started uh, in, uh, in northern Uganda addressing especially vulnerable people, people affected by HIV AIDS and uh, uh, disabled people to give them uh, a chance to sustain themselves uh, out of the very bad situation that was created by the war. Uh, the cooperative is, uh, is producing uh, handicrafts, they are producing uh, um, uh, mat materials like scarves, they are producing necklaces, uh, they are producing uh, uh, tablecloths and, and so on. And uh, they, uh, they are even exporting those, uh, those uh, handicrafts uh, to, to Italy and to other countries uh, comprising uh, the US and Canada. Wow. Um, so the, this being uh, uh, started by people that uh, have, uh, have been and are still vulnerable and sometimes not uh, educated and so on. The um, Good Samaritan has really worked har hard with them to, ca to build on their capacity. And uh, through the support of Foundations for Africa, uh, they have been trained in uh, um, improving the production and uh, like in costing uh, their, uh, their materials, their production. Um, and also in trying to link uh, more and more to, uh, to new markets. Okay. You talked about um, lack of education, which would make me right back to, mm. to, to, to the idea of Avis and education and uh, why you come into the area of education, exactly the nature of your support in that area, considering we have universal primary education, mm. universal secondary education, and free universities for, for people who actually achieve in terms of academics when they perform well. Sure. So, um, APSI has been uh, working in education since it was born. It's uh, one of its main areas of activities uh, because the children are the future and it's important to start from them, uh, from building uh, on them uh, um, to, to have a better future also here in Uganda. So, as you mentioned, I indeed in 97 the, there was a declaration of universal primary education, but from that point uh, and after a few years, the number of children in school almost doubled. Uh, actually more than doubled, but the, with that uh, the infrastructure and the number of teachers did not double accordingly. Mm -hmm. And this uh, I think is, has affected all, of, uh, all the country, but especially in northern Uganda the problem is, um, is that the lack of infrastructure is not only because there's a, there's not been uh, an adaptation of the infrastructure to a number of children, but also uh, the problem of going back home from the IDP camps. In the IDP camps the children had schools where to go, back in their villages uh, they lack again the infrastructure and the teachers. So uh, ABSI comes in in uh, supporting and uh, trying to fill in these gaps. Um, uh, it has been working in 10 schools, uh, five in uh, Kitkum district and five uh, in uh, Guldo district primary schools, uh, trying to, to support the infrastructure. So classrooms uh, have been built, latrines for the children, and also staff houses. Because another big challenge is uh, uh, that the, the teachers uh, are not so much motivated to, to go in the bush and, uh, um, and, uh, and live in areas that are a bit isolated. Uh, and especially, they are not provided with uh, accommodation. And uh, sometimes the community doesn't have the possibility to, uh, to build accommodation for them because they have been uh, busy in uh, building back their own accommodation. And so ABSI has helped also 
in, uh, in building accommodation for the mm. teachers. Really? Yeah. It's a huge debate. I think Avis had better start thinking about ex extending down south because infrastructure mm. in as far as uh, universal secondary primary education is concerned is a huge problem and um, I think there's a way you're helping bail government out. So tell me, why do you insist on the north, much as you've explained mm. that? What happens to somebody because there's also huge problems in certain areas, for instance, there were landmines or landslides mm. in the east. If someone comes and they're into water sanitation, because uh, I forgot to tell you, but one of the areas they're looking at is also water sanitation, among other things. Can they qualify to come and take part or write a proposal the way AMREF did to Foundation for Africa? Okay, uh, uh, of course uh, all the organizations that are working within Foundations for Africa, they, they also work in other areas of Uganda. Some of them are much more concentrated in the north, uh, some others work also in other areas. But Foundations for Africa as a program decided to concentrate in northern Uganda and in Acholi because of the reason that I mentioned, because of the very, very long uh, civil war that has uh, afflicted the country for so long. That was a very special situation that made the people of Acholi more vulnerable than the others. Mm. So as long as the uh, other donors and the same organizations involved in Foundations for Africa also work in other places. Foundations for Africa wanted to, uh, to, to focus on northern Uganda. Interesting. Has AFSI worked elsewhere outside uh, northern Uganda in terms of infrastructure development? Uh, well, we have, um, not exactly in terms of infrastructure development, but in terms of education uh, in, uh, in general and, and distance support, yes. So we, we have uh, uh, more than 12,000 children supported by uh, Italian families. Uh, that support the children paying for, for school fees and so on. Okay, so uh, those so children are not in universal secondary education schools? Uh, even, uh, as I said uh, before, even those that are in universal primary or secondary education, uh, sometimes they don't have, they still need support to, to go to school because the families still need to, to buy for them uh, uniforms and uh, shoes and school material and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, so even if you're entitled to, sometimes you, you cannot go to school, even if uh, you have the right, because you're not put in the, in the conditions of going. So APSI is really uh, focusing on this sector to help children to go to school, supporting them uh, directly to school is also supporting the, the school system. Uh, so, uh, at the moment, uh, education. Ali, you are telling me about something that, um, that I'm sure my audience will also be interested to know. The, the tracking and uh, sure. the promoting tourism. Um, could you please give me further in throw more enlightenment actually right. introduce it to my audience yeah yeah what is tracking what's the background right so this is another initiative uh, promoted by foundations for Africa uh, and it's uh, an initiative of uh, responsible uh, slash sustainable tourism um, it is uh, um, it has two aims uh, the first one is to uh, have uh, an intercultural exchange between the Italian people and the Ugandan people. And then the second one is more of an economic uh, uh, aim. Uh, speaking about the first aim, you can now see the images of uh, the group of people that came here uh, at the end uh, of August. Uh, you can see the, this group of Italians came uh, to, to get to know uh, northern Uganda uh, in a slow way, in a way that was uh, fit to the, to the people in the north. So they wanted to approach the communities going walking, so going slow at uh, the slow path and to walk together with them. This walking together has really made possible for them to, to, to observe them in their daily life um, and to observe also what they have been doing uh, thanks to the Foundations for Africa program. And it was a very amazing uh, in, um, experience for both the Italians and the Ugandans uh, because we have received feedback uh, from both mm -hmm. and uh, even the Ugandan communities that have met these people um, where not all of them have really understood uh, the, the meaning of uh, these people coming to, to walk because, uh, you know, for a Ugandan person, I think it's strange to see an Italian person that takes uh, the holidays and mm -hmm. For sure, they have appreciated being uh, um, in touch with another culture. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then, uh, uh, secondly, um, there is also uh, an economic uh, aim because uh, you know tourism brings uh, um, brings some economic growth. Uh, in the short term, we don't think uh, this intervention can really bring a lot of economic change. But at least in the life of a few people, those that maybe have had the chance to host these uh, tourists uh, or to feed them, they have gained uh, some little bit of money. And in the longer term, hopefully, uh, there will be a little bit more of uh, tourism in northern Uganda thanks to foundations for Africa. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, apart from these people working with these few, the overall, the community, briefly, because time is not our best yeah. ally, how do the community, in terms of developing the idea of tourism and communities participating, how have you made them see it, apart from the people who were participating? What, what, what was the overall reaction and response and the interaction? Okay. Mm. The community uh, were mobilized by the organizations that are the partners of Foundations for Africa and were explained about the meaning of this intervention. And they, and they took it as a big uh, celebration. Basically, it was an occasion for all of them to celebrate a little bit uh, also the, the benefits that they have received from the program and also to welcome some foreigners so you know in the actually culture for welcoming uh, foreigners is very important if a guest arrives then you need really to, to treat him or her as a king or a queen and so it has been a really a very big uh, celebration there was a lot of enjoyment usually it is the north showing the south are there were there some lessons for for the northerners from the south Absolutely, and uh, thi this uh, gives me also the chance to, to tell that there's another initiative that Foundations for Africa has promoted uh, that is exactly to, to explain to the Italian children and youth what's going on in Uganda uh, through inviting some of the, the Uganda students uh, to go to Italy. This has, ha this has happened uh, over the last three years in the Italian schools through visits of uh, uh, youth from uh, uh, Charles Calongo School in, Calo in, uh, in Calongo. Um, and uh, they, they went to Italy, they showed the pic some pictures that uh, they took and they explained about their lives. There were workshops and sensitizations taking place, so it was a very important uh, uh, experience for the Italian children. Wow, amazing. I am curious to know more about that. For you who is at home, you must be like curious to know more about this. Maybe there are questions that you think I'm not dealing with and you want to deal with them. After the break, we are coming to you and we will open the lines. Um, okay, time will not be our ally and we might need to forego the break. In the event that we do, I'd like to engage my colleagues here. Charles, it's not like I forgot you. The, there were still some questions that were burning that I want to come to. And Zura, Charles, yes. before we went to the break, I was curious about this partnership with you have with Kopi. How do you partner with Kopi? Okay, um, thank you. Kopi is another implementing partners of Foundation for Africa. Um, they do the similar thing that SESVI is doing in Agago, but for them they work in Pade. Uh, one additional thing that they're doing in the community is village saving and loan associations. We call it VSLA. Uh, much as we are promoting production and household income, the there is a poor saving culture uh, with our beneficiaries. So COPE is initiating a village saving and loan association to encourage our beneficiaries to save the money they get from the income generation and put it to better use other than spending the money as it comes. So COPE deals in uh, the same thing I've explained as SSV does, but there are pronouns also in additional the uh, intervention of village saving and loan associations. Oh, thank you very much. For me to get uh, more details, I think I'll need like a whole day or at least a program to talk to you. And yet, I also want to hear from Zura. Zura, I I know that you are saying that the other thing that you're working towards is the improvement of, of health services. And uh, I in my mind, what came was maybe you are playing a monetary role in terms of checking out these people if they are delivering the services. How are you improving health services? Actually, with the health services, Sarah, is not only monitoring. Because once you go there, because we have the technical knowledge, so we work with these people to show them exactly what is the, what has to be done. We evaluate what is on the ground, then improve more implementation. 
And all these things, we don't do them alone as an AMREF. It has to be a teamwork. We have to sit with the community and evaluate ourselves, and we come to the solution. And with all these, definitely AMREF does not only work with the Koti alone, even with the ABC. They go to schools with our girls. Thank you very much, Zura. I am so sorry. Time has not been our best ally. I was supposed to have you talk to these people in the studio. I promise you next week I'll create time. Time is not always our best ally, but I'll create time and you're going to have call. We'll have more visitors who are working in line with the, what the vision of Italian cooperation is, brothers in cooperation, changing lives for people, promoting people, pushing development ahead involving the communities they will be in the studio same time do not miss thank you very much for joining us thank, thank you, you. It's, uh, it's been wonderful i've been educated and i had a lot more about uh, what foundation for africa and what your respective organizations do thank you for coming all the way from thank gulu you. i wish you a safe travel back thank you. Thank you did you also much. come back from gulu I am going to go look back indeed. As they say, bon voyage. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thank you.